Big Mood, Little Mood is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. What if comparing car insurance rates was as easy as putting on your favorite podcast? With Progressive, it is. Just visit the Progressive website to quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's direct rate, then their tool will provide options with other companies so that you can compare. All you need to do is choose the rate and coverage you like. Get a quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Just a reminder that Big Mood, Little Mood with Daniel M. Lavery happens twice a week. Slate Plus members get an additional mini episode or Little Big Mood every Friday. Sign up now to listen at slate.com slash mood. Back to Big Mood, Little Mood. I'm your host, Danny Lavery, and with me in the studio this week is Seth Durlin, a career counselor at a law school and a parent of two kindergartners in the Bronx. Seth, welcome to the show. Thank you, Danny. I'm so pleased that you're here. I wish I could have gotten you more career or law-based questions, but I didn't. Probably better this way. And we're just going to have to roll with it. How are you? How are you doing? Are you feeling uh, equipped to advise people today? I think I never feel equipped to advise anyone, which is exactly why I want to advise the masses. Okay. Well, good. And, you know, again, as as always, people are free to ignore whatever advice we offer on the show. No one will be sent to your home to follow up later and to make sure you do the things that I tell you. So that's always, I think, a nice load off. That's a different uh, podcast entirely. I would imagine. You'd have to have a huge budget to be following up with everybody who emailed uh, and, and ensuring compliance. So I'm glad we don't do that. I'm also very excited because our first letter has one of my favorite interpersonal problems, which is a vacation with friends gone bad. Just because I think like there's there's no end to ways a group vacation can fall apart. And I always find it fascinating and I always find it incredibly difficult to not rubberneck at. So this is just really, if you ever want to make sure your letter rises to the top, tell me about a bad group vacation that you've been on lately and I will almost certainly answer it as soon as I see it. And if you're ever looking to ditch a friend uh, or end a relationship, you just set up a nice group vacation. Just go on a group trip together and then, you know, make sure that you know what some load-bearing issues are in that relationship that you can really lean on. So with that out of the way, the subject is unexorcised. Four years ago. So that's the other thing too, is like, this is, this is a, this is a long ago group trip. I kind of love this. Four years ago, I was traveling abroad with friends and had an unexpected flare up of my chronic pain condition. The pain and resultant insomnia made socializing very hard. I didn't lash out, but I was subdued and often took breaks from the group. My then friend, Gina, who has a bad temper, took my retreats as a personal affront. She confronted me angrily in front of our friends, including my partner, about how I was ruining the trip. She accused me of bad communication and, when I rejected her version of events, said the pain had made my memory unreliable. My partner, who's admittedly biased but also tends to tell it to me straight, has affirmed my account of the trip. The next day, Gina said she wanted to part ways for the rest of the trip, which angered me further, but I agreed was for the best. This fight and public humiliation likely contributed to keeping my pain high for months afterwards. This condition is worsened by stress. Today, Gina and I remain estranged, which is my preference. However, because two of my best friends are close with her, I have to see her a few times a year. It's awkward, but tolerable. I'm more troubled by the fact that my two friends still choose to remain tight with her. I'm tortured by the thought that they have accepted her aversion of events instead of mine, that I am a selfish hypochondriac or whatever she told them. How can I learn not to resent these friends? How can I learn not to dread seeing someone who will never admit she was wrong? I I found this very, like, charmingly relatable. I don't mean charming in the sense that this sounds fun, but one of the things that really leapt out to me in this letter was reading between the lines, my sense was that the letter writer had either said or intimated toward their friends some version of, just because Gina and I aren't friends anymore doesn't mean you have to choose sides. And probably meant it in the moment. And then every day since has been sort of 
unwillingly tallying in the back of their head. Ah, and I see today they didn't choose to dump her as a friend either. Interesting. Interesting, you sons of bitches. Like, and I I find that so relatable, that like idea of like, I know what the reasonable thing to say is, and of course I'm going to say it. And also just as, of course, in the back of my head, fuck the reasonable thing. You should hate this bitch with me because she's a jerk. And that's a very human, understandable feeling to have about friendship, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And w- one thing that jumped out at me was um, she says it's awkward but tolerable, but she's also tortured. Um, although, actually, I don't know uh, if this is a she. So they're tortured by this four years later. So it's absolutely just so something that would happen uh, in any friend group where it's like, I told you you didn't have to choose, but you do. Mm-hmm. And to be clear, I don't think that the answer to this letter writer's problem is going to be go back and tell your friends that they need to dump Gina. I don't think that that is the way forward. But I I do just want to really stress it is, I think, quite understandable. And I myself have felt this way, rightly or wrongly, reasonably or unreasonably. A lot of us do want our closest friends to share our allegiances, our antipathies, our uh, rivalries and our resentments. Um, and that it is not like shocking or out of left field that you've been feeling this way. It's not an insurmountable problem. Um, I get where it's coming from. It makes a lot of sense to me. But the, what they actually wrote in asking, right, is how do I get over the feelings? Which is like that classic kind of like throw away. I just want to try to get over these feelings. But we all, that's impossible, right? Or given time, eventually it'll probably fade. So I kind of want to know, you know, what what do you really want to happen? Do you want to have a conversation with these friends and find out if they accepted this version of events? Or do you just really want to like never, if it's only a few times a year, do you want that number of times to now be zero? And I think that might be more useful than how to get over this like, situation that does sound like it was really unfair and really painful to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think I'm right there with you in terms of it's not super clear to me what those several times a year are. But it does sound to me like you've just hit a pretty understandable breaking point, which is you have a former friend you had a pretty spectacular blow up with four years ago. And, you know, three or four meetings a year where you have to sort of like either carefully ignore one another or pretend to be friendly, that's kind of a lot. I I feel like usually if I've had a friendship like end on bad terms, we don't still celebrate Christmas together or, you know, meet up. Like that doesn't mean that I've been able to wipe someone else from the face of the earth. Just like when a friendship ends and ends badly, usually the thing people then do is really not see each other. And so I, I really think that maybe what you're experiencing, letter writer, is, okay, for a couple of years it was okay putting up with this, but I'm just, I'm hitting a, a breaking point. And again, I don't think that it would be right for you to tell your other friends, I demand that you stop inviting her to these events. But whatever they are, I think you do need to share, like, it's actually not working for me anymore to do the, like, amicable divorce thing with Gina, and I'm not telling you that you can't again, just like you're not going to tell other people to do things differently. You're just going to need to make other arrangements, whatever these group events are, either scheduling your own follow up with your friends at another time or making other plans on those days. And that might itself be difficult or inconvenient or even sometimes sad. But I I think it would be a better set of problems than the problem you currently have. Right. And it would be really useful to know Again, like what these events are, are they related to, is it work? Are these all people who work in a similar industry or live in a close enough community where they're just regularly seeing each other? Are the events something where it's only 10 of you and it's really hard to avoid her? Or is it something where there's like 20 to 30 people and you can actually kind of get lost in the crowd? But it's got to be painful because they also say, you know, these isn't just two of her their friends, but uh, two of their very best friends. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really do think just having that conversation and asking for a little kindness and care and to really like be affirmed that they care about you, even though 
they have this friend who they probably know has a bad temper and who has maybe, you know, estranged other people in in their friendships. But just say, you know, I'm feeling just still kind of sad about this. And you don't think that I'm totally making this up, do you? Yeah, I think rather than asking, a, because I think that's a kind of loaded question to ask a friend, which is not to say that the letter writer shouldn't potentially bring that trip up, because I agree, it, it kind of sounds like, trying to read between the lines here, it sounds like everybody who is on that vacation, that includes the two closest friends, right? Do you think, I would think that because they say they accepted her version of events, it sounds to me like they weren't on the trip. Yeah. So then I think this is a good point of clarification. Letter writer, if these friends were on the trip with you and part of what you're kind of realizing is is an unanswered question for you is maybe maybe you would have liked them to have stuck up for you in that moment. If they were like there and they heard her say those things and they just kind of looked awkwardly away or didn't you know, come to your defense at all, maybe you want to talk with them about that. And that would be very, very understandable. And if they weren't there, maybe you want to just let them know, again, not like, let me give you a laundry list of everything Gina ever has ever done wrong, or I, I need you to like make a friendship ruling about the five things that she did that bothered me the most. But some some kind of conversation around like, I just want to make it clear since you and I maybe haven't talked about this because it's slightly uncomfortable. Our friendship ended when, like, on a group vacation, I had a pain flare-up and was really tired and stayed in my room a lot. And she yelled at me and and accused me of not communicating my pain well uh, and, and that I didn't know what I was doing. And, and that was really obviously painful and embarrassing. So it wasn't just, like, a misunderstanding. It was this really painful episode. Again, I think it, it is usually better not to ask or expect a friend to, like, denounce someone on your behalf, but you can at least say, like, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from, why it's better for me not to share a room with her, and I'd really appreciate it if you let me know if you've heard something wildly different. That strikes me as a reasonable possible set of things you could say to these friends. Assuming that these are truly your best friends, hopefully you have that kind of relationship. And then not to put too much back on the letter writer entirely, but if you're really worried about this feeling like, oh, do my friends think I'm a selfish hypochondriac? Is that only because of Gina? Or are you like just, you know, internalizing a lot of ableism about this? And maybe it's something that you could dig deeper into with a therapist or journaling or, you know, talking to a partner. Because a lot of times I, I've found that when a friend or ex-friend has said something, even if it feels so unfair, if it's hitting close to home, that's worth sort of examining. And similarly, you know, like how are these, you say that there are these feelings of dread in mm-hmm. having to see her. And how does that manifest? You know, how does your body feel? What's going on in, in that circumstance? And maybe trying to really just address the, the physicality of it could help get away from these people who I care about and I know care about me. I'm worried about what they're thinking. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And and really for this letter writer, I think I agree. Like pay attention to the dread. I just really think that's a sign. It's 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 time to stop hanging out with her a few times a year. And ideally you will be able to communicate that with your friends and make it clear both like I'm not asking you guys to maintain this boundary for me anymore, but I am letting you know that like in the future, I'm going to make different arrangements where we don't spend time together. Um, and I, I do want you to respect that. Um, so, and then, you know, just beyond that, obviously it is always delicate and difficult to say, you know, to a friend, I want to know if someone else has been saying X, Y, or Z about me. Will you give it to me straight? There are a lot of people who will definitely not give it to you straight and will start like stumbling and muttering and like, oh, uh, 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 I have to go. My home planet needs me. So that's, you know, Potentially, again, that doesn't mean you shouldn't bring it up or that you can't, just that sometimes otherwise like loving and clear people get a little evasive when it comes to this kind of thing. But but then that also should, I think, be balanced with if there's a part of you that wants to talk about this more with your friends, I think you absolutely have the grounds to do that. But if ultimately you feel like actually it just hurts a lot that they stay friends with her, I would encourage you also to, 
I would put that under the like serenity prayer category of things you cannot change, which is they might vary. You know, it could be any number of things, right? Like they could think she behaved badly on that vacation and don't like the way that she treated you, but also feel like she's still a friend of mine who I care about. I put this under the list of like her faults uh, or things that she hasn't done well, but that's not the same thing as like I want to denounce her or end our friendship. And that there, there may also be elements of they're sometimes afraid to offer important, necessary feedback, pushback, criticism because they're afraid of her bad temper too, which would probably not be their strongest character points uh, as people, but is also, I think, human and under- understandable. So just to set the boundaries where you need them and to try to be reasonably open to the possibility that your friends don't necessarily think that Gina behaved well on that trip, but also care about her and want to maintain a friendship with her, which you don't have to share, but I do think you could understand. Does that, Seth, strike you as reasonable? Does that strike you as too accommodating? I, I want to try to balance, like, just based on this letter, I, I think I agree. Gina just acted like a real asshole on this trip, but I can also understand somebody else feeling like I have a friend who, like, treated another friend really badly and I don't like that about them, but I still care about them and want them in my life. Does that seem to you like a place where reasonable people could reasonably disagree? Or do you think this is more of a like, actually the letter writer should consider pushing their friends to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, ethically robust or strict with Gina? What do you think? Whomst among us does not have at least one friend who we think is kind of an asshole. That sort of being in community with people, right, is that we know that we've all done some stuff that is not great, and we hope that people would have patience with us, you know, when we've done those those harmful things too, right? Which, no, again, I really don't want to say letter writer like, oh, it's totally like just... It's fine that they are still just letting her be kind of a dick over the years, but... It is. It's a very, very human and conflict avoidant. And I think that's okay. But yeah, it's okay to also let them know that you're basically done here. And thank God it is only a couple, you know, a few times a year because it seems like this is something that, yeah, you can make alternate plans and let them know that and let them make their own decisions. Yeah. And, you know, I think as you were saying, really pay attention to the dread And so, as is often the case, you know, I want to steer someone away from how can I not resent someone into is there a resentment that you think would benefit from like honest conversation and redress versus not taking it so far that you feel like I'll only feel okay if I can get these friends to agree that Gina is a bad friend and that they don't want to see her anymore. So I think somewhere in between those two, it's like, I I think it's okay for you to say that you're just not up for spending time with Gina anymore. Even having a conversation with them where you just kind of say like, I just really want to lay out like what was so painful about the end of our friendship. And while I don't in any way want to try to tell you who to be friends with or how to conduct your friendships with other people, I also want you to know that one way you can support me and be a good friend to me is don't invite me to stuff that you know Gina is going to be at. Uh, You know, respect the boundary that I'm setting. And ideally, you'll be able to have slightly like open or meaningful or mutually vulnerable conversations about that trip. And I I guess I'll just close with, I really hope that they meet you in the middle. If you like disclose something vulnerable or share that you want to do something different and all you get back in return is you're being unreasonable, Gina's cool, why can't you just be cool, get over it, then I would really encourage you to prioritize some of your other friendships pull back a little bit here i hope they don't do that um i hope that they respond really well to this but in that case it would make a lot of sense to me if you felt like this is you know again not like i i'm gonna denounce you and shake the dust of your house off of my sandals and walk away forever but that that would maybe be an indicator that somebody has moved out of like best friend territory and into like friend i see a few times a year at bigger social gatherings territory yeah exactly Ah, well, good luck with this. I'm really sorry. That sounds really, really painful. Um, Gina just, I I hope she stops doing this. I hope someday she learns that apologies are actually not the worst thing in the world, but are in fact often a great way to keep people in your life if you've done wrong, or at least like to stop doing that wrong thing over and over again. 
And I'm, I'm glad that your partner is, you know, like biased in your favor and tells it to you straight. That's a great combination of, of qualities and a partner. And I hope you have a lot of other supportive, meaningful relationships in your life. Macy's is committed to supporting college access and better student outcomes. Throughout May, join Macy's in celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI Heritage Month by supporting APIA scholars, whose mission is to equip AAPI young adults with the resources they need to succeed in higher education and beyond. Just round up your next in-store purchase or donate online to APIA scholars. Shop AAPI-owned products and learn more at macy's.com slash purpose. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Speaking of exciting and supportive and meaningful relationships, Seth, do you want to read our next letter? Subject. Not an omelet station. I'm surrounded by eggs, and I don't know how to handle it. When I first came out as trans, I thought I would have a lot of explaining to do, but most of my friends confided in me that my transition made them feel inspired to be more open and honest with themselves about their own gender identities. I was thrilled for them, asked about pronouns, and answered questions about my transition. And then, nothing. Years passed. No one knew new pronouns, or if they tried, very briefly, Besides the people who actively confess to me, my nominally cis partner keeps dropping more and more hints that they aren't cis either. When I ask about it, they never say, I'm happy in my assigned gender at birth. They say, transition would be way too complicated and difficult. That seems to be the consensus among the whole group. I'm not sure if I gave that impression, I'm so much happier now than before I came out and they can all see that, or if it's just that they're very aware of how dangerous it is for trans people right now. But I don't know how to treat any of these people when my brain knows that the pronouns they're using publicly aren't correct. Or while they all just, to allude to your work, avoid ordering the fries, seemingly forever. How can I support them? I haven't brought it up again for a while with anyone but my partner. And I know I should probably stop prying there as well. Is there anything I can do besides stay silent while my loved ones figure things out? Should we define our terms uh, before we jump into this? I, I don't want to make too many assumptions here, but I think it would be maybe useful to talk for a moment about what eggs or egginess means and, and whether or not that's like applicable in the scenario. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So my understanding of like the term egg is usually that it can kind of only be used retroactively. Not that that stops people from trying to or labeling somebody else as as one. But essentially, like the term, to the best of my understanding, is, is one that trans people use to refer to previous versions of themselves, usually like before they had any conscious awareness that they were trans. And so the idea, right, is like you're an egg before you have hatched. And so part of what it seems to involve is not just, like it's, it's different from being closeted, right? Because you can be mm. closeted and still have a pretty like, conscious understanding of yourself as a trans person whereas like oh i was such an egg when i was like really into burlesque or whatever is usually like maybe performing some sort of like compensatory gendered activity in order to distract from a potentially like fraught series of questions that we don't want to deal with yet so uh, n- none of this is by the way to say like oh letter writer you got to use your terms correctly or anything just my sense here is you've talked to a number of people who have shared to a varying degree of commitment, certain feelings about their own gender or their own, like, sex assignment at birth that leaves you sort of wondering, well, what just happened here? Like, is am I thinking of this person as, like, a future trans person of America? Am I thinking of this person as somebody questioning? Am I thinking of this person as, like, a series of inevitabilities? So, again, not like, I, I don't think, like, there's anything evil or wrong about calling somebody an egg casually. I just think 
it does treat future transition as like an inevitable foregone conclusion when I don't necessarily think that's the case. And so I'm just wondering what your familiarity with this term is, how you might have heard it used and and whether or not you think it's useful here. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I haven't thought that much about what the term means because mostly it is sort of tongue in cheek or flippantly used on the internet. I would sort of think that there's so many people who have a sense of themselves as some flavor of trans before they come out, but are doing gymnastics around it. That I've known enough people for whom it was sort of a possibility that they'd considered and just maybe decided wasn't the right time that I don't know that it has to be totally an unknowing. And who knows, you know, do baby chickens have some sense of themselves before they hatch? I literally have no idea. Probably not. Um, But I still think it is a little bit useful because, as you sort of alluded to, it's more about what the letter writer's experience of them is. Mm -hmm. And I, I definitely got the sense that they did think that this was an inevitability. But I think that because all they said was open and honest with themselves about their own gender identities, which could encompass such a wide spectrum of possibility, that it seems like they could be eggs forever. And the letter writer really just wants to be doing right by them, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So if it's helpful for them to maybe just think of them as eggs and allow themselves to like tap on that egg a little bit. And if it doesn't work, you know, don't be pushy, don't be rude. But if this is your understanding of them and understanding of the term, it might help inform how, you know, they they go forward. Yeah. This is useful. I think this helps clarify, at least for me, what I think of as being the sort of like criteria, which is uh, you can be an egg in retrospect. You can't be an egg in real time. You're an egg after you've hatched. So if you have, and again, I'm using the term transition here really, really widely. I don't necessarily mean that it has to involve like hormonal or medical transition, although obviously it often does. But I, I do think like prior to transition, You are talking about possibilities. You are talking about feelings, impulses, thoughts, identifications, all of which you're entitled to do, of course. But like the the only reason I would encourage this letter writer not to necessarily think of all of these people as eggs is because in my own experience, my transition also brought a lot of people out of the woodwork to share some thoughts and feelings with me about transition. Most of them went on to, again, this is just from my own viewpoint, um, live continuous lives. And so I'm not trying to make a lot of identity claims about how they do or don't feel about themselves now, but just based on how they interacted in their ongoing like romantic and personal relationships, uh, their communities, the people they tended to, to like be around, um, things were continuous. So all I really know is that at one point in that person's life, they shared some thoughts and feelings about their gender with me, which is great. But that doesn't mean that they all like set off an inevitable like Rube Goldberg machine whereby they will have to transition in the next 20 years. And and I think that's why I've been doing a lot of throat clearing before getting into this question is like, there are genuinely a lot of people who have some thoughts and questions about their gender, not quite sure what to do with it. Somebody close to them transitions and, and they sort of often without even realizing it sort of think like, oh, somebody close to me has transitioned. We already talked some about our personal lives. I'll share some of these thoughts with them. And some of those people go on to transition and some of them don't. And some of them go on to change some ways that they think or treat themselves and some of them don't. And I think that's all good. Like, I think it's genuinely a good possible outcome if someone for a little while talks about some of their questions or feelings about gender with a friend who's recently transitioned and then later decides, oh, those were some interesting thoughts, but for whatever reason, I'm going to choose and prioritize the life that I have now in this other direction. So, again, none of that's to say, like, you have to call them sis or, like, write back five years later and say, like, time's up. Just that they're not all necessarily inevitably 
categorically, definitively trans people. They are people who might decide to transition someday and might not. And I do think that's going to be a lot easier than thinking of, gosh, I know eight people in the closet. And if I could just convince them that transitioning is a good idea, I can save them all like too much time in the closet or uh, a bunch of heartache that I wish I could have been spared so much as just like, people who gave me a brief snapshot into my thoughts, their thoughts and feelings. And again, like some of this is informed by my own sense of like, I definitely thought the first couple like months after I started transitioning, wow, I know so many trans people. So many people are about to transition. And now, you know, six years on, five years on, it's like, no, almost none of those people did. And that's great and fine. And maybe some of them eventually will later. But a lot of them were just sort of like thinking out loud. Yeah. And also, I think that's a really useful reframe because it it does really take, I think, a, a weight off the letter writer to feel like they are either misgendering their friends constantly in public right. or um, ke- keeping them somehow from doing the from doing the inevitable or feel like. I've made transition look hard, right? Um, which I think they're worried about. Right, I failed to be inspirational enough. Right, right. But I also think that that doesn't mean that you can't, like, unless you are in a queerphobic friend group, which I really hope you aren't, and it doesn't sound like you are, uh, then playfully drop, like, a few girls or bros as appropriate around some of these friends and see how they react. You know, don't make anyone feel unsafe. And if they say, like, hey, knock that off. Right, don't maybe do it in the the middle of happy birthday in front of a bunch of other people. (laughs) Right. But if it, you know, if your friends are open-minded, throw it out there and let them knock it back or not to you. And, you know, if if you are in a queer friend group, that's probably not that unusual anyway. Right? Yeah, I, I think I just, to me, the thing that I want to steer the letter writer away from is feeling like you have been made like a tontine of a bunch of other people's secret trans identities And that you've got to safeguard or shepherd them or like check back in every six months. And if you fail to do your job right, a trans person will languish and die inside of like a cis exoskeleton. And I think that's a real, I think that would at best lead to a bunch of confusion and resentment for you. And so I want you to, in the future, take anybody telling you sometimes they think about transition really lightly. I don't mean flippantly. I don't mean casually. I don't mean like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back in 10 years and we'll see. Uh, I just mean in terms of like, that's really interesting and cool that they've shared this thought with me. And who knows, this could go in a million different directions because it genuinely could, right? Like think of it like a friend saying, oh, you know, I'm thinking about getting married or, oh, I'm thinking about moving to Boston. Like maybe they'll move to Boston. Maybe they won't. If they don't, it's not necessarily that they like didn't care enough about Boston or you didn't give them enough information about Boston. It's that there are really a lot of different possible choices and identities people can inhabit and like autonomy and the freedom of choice is really good and important. But none of that necessarily means that as soon as somebody says someday I'd like to live in Boston, it means any version of their life where they don't live in Boston is like a horrible, inauthentic nightmare. And I I don't think... If somebody else doesn't want transition enough to choose it, there's no amount of external support or cheerleading or inspiration that can make up for it. So again, that doesn't mean it's not important or meaningful, but you really, really can't make it look so easy that somebody else decides they want to. And so that's why I think you should hold it lightly, because if somebody wants to, they'll come to you again. You know, you've already made it clear that you're down to talk about it. You're already trans all the time. You know, they can see that you're doing it. If they don't want it, and again, I don't mean like if they don't want it enough, like, oh, you didn't have the guts, you didn't have the heart. Like, I don't mean it like that at all. I just mean in terms of if you want something enough that you want your life to look like that, you'll choose it. And if you don't choose it, you haven't chosen it. That's it. That's a morally neutral statement. Yeah, I think in general, this is a good kind of reminder for all of us in interpersonal relationships and it comes up a lot in the counseling space of feeling like if I, you know, put this out there, if I work, you know, for myself, I work with someone and we've identified, you know, like the next steps for you and finding the work that you want to do. And here's some options for people to contact. Half the time, you know, they don't, 
do any of those things. And, or maybe they do a few years later. Just in general, I think when you're having a a conversation that can feel really deep, right? When you're talking about gender identity, (laughs) it feels very fraught, like this is going to change someone's life forever. And the vast majority of the time, we're all just living, we're talking to each other, we're making our own decisions and kind of taking like sprinkles from the things that, uh, you know, people say to us or give us advice about. So yeah, take, take the pressure off. You don't need to do anything. But also, if you want to follow up, how's, you know, so how's your gender doing mm-hmm. is a totally acceptable question. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's just like, it's a good thing. I think one of the real side effects of increased visibility of trans people has been more people think about it, not necessarily in the sense of a billion million more people transition so much as just like, yeah, when something happens more frequently or you're more aware of something, you're going to notice it more. And so there's also going to be an uptake in people stopping and saying, hang on a minute, do I want to do this? And they might genuinely decide, no, but I'm glad I thought about it. And that's really a good thing. Like, that is a great outcome. I think it is really wonderful, good, interesting, complex. If what happened was you transitioned, a couple of your friends talked and thought a little bit more about their own gender, decided ultimately that they were, like, good with the mix of things they were doing and carried on with their lives. Like, that's good. That's not like a default on a promissory note. They they did something cool and fine. That's literally what we would hope for is that more people are thinking about their gender and whatever they decide to do with. Right. But of course, it, it also can feel difficult to recognize because if you have decided to transition, presumably you also had a similar moment in your life where you're like, hang on a second. And then that eventually sort of snowballed into like a deep rooted vocational sense of like, sure, trepidation, but also like joy and delight and like, I've got to have it. And so it can feel like, well, surely that's coming down the pike for you too. And I felt so good when I finally transitioned because I was at last like prioritizing those impulses that that's just what I want for everyone. And it can be really genuinely difficult to think like, wow, someone else could have a moment of questioning their gender and not necessarily the same follow-up series of impulses, identifications, desires, and joys that I did. And that's just one of the reasons that like, navigating the interiority of others is really challenging. Do you feel like there's any different advice regarding the letter writer's partner? I do, yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I think we've probably exhausted our advice to them about their friends and acquaintances. Part of me feels very sympathetic to that nominally cis partner, and part of me feels a little bit brusque. And I don't necessarily think either one is wrong, But also I want to be careful that a little bit brusque doesn't turn into needlessly dismissive. To me, dropping a lot of hints and then saying there's nothing to be done is a kind of maddening thing to have to contend with. I don't like that. I don't like it when someone drops a lot of hints. And then when you say, would you like to do something about it? They're like, oh, nothing to be done. Again, it's very understandable, very relatable. I've done it myself. But it is also a difficult position for the letter writer to be in. So I could imagine either saying one of two things. One would be, hey, you've been dropping a lot of hints. And when I've been trying to talk to you about the possibility of transition, you've just been pointing out that it would be too complicated. I hear you. And so I'm not going to keep following up with that. If you drop a hint in the future, I'm just going to let it sit there. Like you're allowed to say that, whatever. But just know that if you ever want to have a different kind of conversation with me about this, just ask. And so that's just kind of like letting your partner know I'm not going to be like monitoring you for hints and shutting them down, but I'm not going to be like dropping everything and be like, oh, a hint, a hint. Do you want me to do you want me to do something? Because it's been like going in the same direction. And that way kind of just makes it clear if you ever change your mind about whether or not those difficult complications are worth it, I'm around. And if not, I'm going to be a little bit more of a gray rock when it comes to your hints. And, And I think that strikes a good balance between compassion and like, not engaging with something sort of frustrating. But tell me if you think that feels a little bit um, insensitive and I'm happy to talk about other options. No, I mean, I think that they are sort of in that place as well. You know, it's saying I should stop prying. Prying such a specific word that, that means like, I feel like I'm doing too much. And especially, you know, as the partner who has already transitioned, frankly, even if they are doing some work uh, that, leads them to transition at some point. It it just may not be with you. 
because that feels too big for them. So I think that's okay. And just reiterating support is obviously going to be a good idea if they want to throw out like also one last, like, you know, the center has always been a, a good place for me to find resources. Or if you, you know, ever like to look for, a, you know, gender therapist, I'd be happy to share with you what I have and I'm not going to bring it up again. Seems fair and kind. Yeah. And I think the reason that I have just found myself a little bit bristly is, again, this is not even, this is certainly not like a mortal sin. It's like venial at best. But a thing sometimes people who are like actively trying to like swim away from transition sometimes do to trans people that I don't love is like dropping a lot of hints or bringing up the fact that transition would be complicated and difficult to someone who's doing it. It's just like, again, I'm sure it's not anyone's intention to like put someone else down, but it's just like, yeah, they know that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like I, I would really bristle if somebody in my life was saying repeatedly to me, like, oh, I wish I could transition. And then I was like, oh, did you say something about transitioning? They're like, no, it's difficult and awful. I'd just be like, all right, don't do it. Then. Like to me, that's the thing that, that would get my goat a little bit is like, then don't do it. And like, obviously the thing they don't want to hear is, well, then don't fucking do it. They want to hear something else. And I think it's better to ask outright for like support or sympathy or care when you are like, here's what I want right now. But if it's just like you want me to endlessly reassure you that transition's too awful for you to ever like blight your life with, like I'm not going to do that. And I actually would eventually find that pretty difficult to be in a relationship with someone. That's not to say I would like dump someone the third time they were like, huh, I wonder if I have thoughts about my gender. Just like I have a real inflexibility around that because I think that's a not unheard of pattern of like somebody dating somebody who has already transitioned in the sort of hopes of like I can draft behind you and get some sort of like blowback transition fumes um from proximity but I without really having to do anything and like again it's genuinely fine if you decide you don't want to transition don't there's so many cool and interesting things you can do with your life you don't have to but I think own that then, like own the decision not to and figure out something else that you would like to do. But if it's like, I want to do it, but I want it to happen somehow like externally of me, it's like, well, that's never going to happen um, outside of pretty specific Georgette Heyer novels and some specific pornography. Forced transition is not really a thing. And, and it can genuinely be pretty thoughtless to say to someone who's transitioning or has transitioned, It's again, it's like I'm not saying like, oh, man, talking through your fears or your anxieties, totally understandable. Absolutely. Hundred percent. Not being sure about what you want to do next. Hundred percent. But if it's just like I could never even talk about that possibility, it's way too complicated and difficult. You're going to get diminishing returns talking to trans people about that because it's just like, well, yeah, it's been complicated, and difficult for a pretty long time, but people still do it. Alternatively, letter writer becomes an IR. IRL version of the guy on Twitter who just gives people permission to transition and wakes up every morning and goes, hormones today? Let's let's get you to the clinic? Yeah. I don't really think that that would be functional. But I, yeah, I think letter writer, see if any of that, what Danny said about that dynamic feels applicable to your relationship and, and see how, what that would feel like to implement in your life. Yeah, I, I think this is just helpful too because I think where I really come down on it is I would always want to be available and I am available for people in my life who want to talk about possibilities that surprise or unnerve or um, throw them off kilter um, and always want to be able to provide support for anybody who's questioning or considering something and isn't sure where the their like search is going to take them. That's all really good, appropriate, normal stuff. But the thing that I tend to be a little bit less compassionate about and again that doesn't mean like cutting somebody off or yelling at them or anything it just means like all right well let's get out of this territory pretty fast um is that sort of endless wait letting i dare not wait upon i dare like the cat in the adage (laughs) which is just like yeah it's hard it's difficult people lose stuff but then either at a certain point you decide it's worth it or you decide not to do it and you need to own whichever choice you've made and sort of endlessly 
sighing or dropping hints or hinting darkly at something and then expecting sort of endless reassurance from somebody else who's who's transition you're hoping to get by proximity that can turn into something really um morbid and that's not to say that this is definitely going to happen with this letter writer's partner just that that's it's potentially heading down that road and i want the letter writer to be aware that you can be compassionate and open and also say to your partner like if you ever want to talk about this more here are some resources you can go check out. If you ever want to, like a direct conversation with me about your options, I'm available for that. I'm just not available for this one type of conversation where you hint and I guess. Um, and so that's not like, hey, shit or get off the pot. And so I think that's like where I want to make sure I'm landing. It's not like dismissive, premature derision. Yeah, that seems fair. Cool. But yeah, it's just like, yeah, transitioning is hard. It's always been hard. And so it's just kind of like, what do you want me to say at a certain point? Like, it's hard. Do it or don't. Endless rumination on anything is usually kind of hard to listen to at a certain point. Yeah. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a little bit like someone's like, oh, I, I could never do whatever it is that you've done. And it's like, I appreciate that this is meant to be a compliment, but it also kind of implies that, like, I'm really making a fool of myself and you're relieved that you're not. And, like, there's a limit to how much patience I'm going to have for that kind of thing, uh, no matter what else that person might be going through. So with that, Seth, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. And I hope very, very much that all the kindergartners and confused lawyers in your life benefit from the same sort of gentle, peaceful wisdom today that I and my listeners have gotten to benefit from. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Dan. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Don't miss an episode of the show. Head to slate.com slash mood to sign up to subscribe or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Thanks. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice or conversations with our guest. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. If you'd like me to read your letter on the show, maybe you need a little advice, maybe you need some big advice, head to slate.com slash mood to find our Big Mood, Little Mood listener question form or find a link in the description on the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. Man, this letter has everything. I'm, I'm glad this wasn't coming down the pike when I was doing Prudence still, because this would, like, <laughs> we'd have to lock the comments after a million pages, like weddings, veganism, menu etiquettes, Uncle Dave, mom coming to you on behalf of Uncle Dave. Like, this has it all. Parents paying for the wedding, but expressing some hesitation. Yeah. To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood.